field that is being used as a replacement for animal therapy in nursing homes, which is really kind of awesome. So she builds planets on Earth, you guys. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our very special program, Worlds in Shadow. I'm James Monroe. I'm the producer of adult programs and theater experiences here at the Museum of Science Boston. And I'm so excited to be introducing our very special guest tonight, joining us live all the way from Australia. We are joined by Patrick Nunn, the author of the upcoming release, Worlds in Shadow, Submerged Lands in Science, Memory, and Myth. And this is the incredible book that is at the heart of our conversation tonight. We're so lucky to have Patrick here with us live to dig in deep into the research around the book, the science of submergence, and so much more. And tonight is just a part of our current subspace fall season of adult programming here at the museum. We have an incredible lineup of events and experiences, both virtual and on site, every week now through December. So I encourage you to check out that full lineup and grab all of your tickets for all these events by visiting our website at mos.org adults. And if you want to learn a little bit more about Patrick and all of his work, as well as where you can pre-order your very own copy of Worlds in Shadow at a discounted rate just for tuning in tonight as well, uh, you can do so by checking out our virtual program. Just pull out your smartphone and scan that QR code that is on your screen right now to do so. And I'll be back a little bit later on for a Q&A with Patrick. So if you have a question for him at any point, uh, you can submit that starting right now by going to slido.com and entering the code Patrick Nunn, all one word, just as it appears on your screen right now. Once again, that's slido, S-L-I-D-O.com with the code Patrick Nunn, all one word. I need to thank our friends from the Lowell Institute for their continued support of the adult programming. Without them, we would not be here tonight, and this event would not be free for all of you. So please join me in giving a huge virtual round of applause and thanks to our friends at the Lowell Institute. And finally, after the talk tonight, I ask all of you to consider going to donate.mos.org slash MOS at home and make a gift to allow us to keep bringing programming just like tonight to all of you. Once again, that's donate.mos.org slash MOS at home. But now it's my pleasure to welcome to your screen our very special guest tonight, author of Worlds in Shadow, all the way from Australia, author Patrick Nunn. Thank you very much, James. Let me just share my screen and I will get started. It's a beautiful morning here in Australia. And uh, that should be all right. Does that look good, James? OK, well, thank you all very much for uh, coming this evening. Um, I'm talking to you live from uh, the beautiful Sunshine Coast in southeast Queensland in Australia. Um, we've had nothing but rain for the last three days, but now the sun is out, and it uh, looks like it's going to be a beautiful uh, uh, week for, um, uh, for a while, at least, uh, beautiful weather. Um, I wanted to talk about my new book, Worlds in Shadow, but more than that, I really just wanted to talk about the whole topic of lands that are submerged, lands where people once lived that are now underwater or typically under the sea. And there's a lot of untruth about this subject. Hey, it's Patrick, been a great topic. It's James here. Yeah? I'm so sorry to interrupt, but your slides don't seem to be on screen. Can you try resharing again? Sure. There we go. Now just get them in full screen and we are good to go. So sorry about that. My apologies for that. Let me let me do a brief recap. I'm talking to you today from uh, southeast Queensland uh, on the uh, in the beautiful country of Australia. Beautiful weather here this morning and uh, I hope you're all having a, a lovely evening there in the United States. I wanted to talk about my new book, but more than that, I wanted to talk about uh, stories of submerged lands. 
um, that I have really been trying to come to terms with, I suppose, for most of my life. Um, I'm a geologist and a climate scientist by profession. Um, I'm I'm very much a conventionally trained scientist, but I also I like to think that I have an open mind when it comes to thinking about uh, things like stories of uh, submerged lands. So I also need to just say that I'm proudly speaking today from the ancestral lands of the Cubby Cubby people uh, here in southeast Queensland uh, in Australia. And it's very appropriate that I acknowledge the Cubby Cubby people because a lot of what I'm talking about uh, this evening um, is really uh, privileging indigenous knowledge and others' understanding of the natural world, as, as you will see. So there's five things that I want to do this evening. Um, first of all, I want to give you a little bit of context, setting the scene. What, what am I talking about? Why is, why is this important? And how did my journey uh, to this point, um, how did that unfold? The second thing I want to do is talking about our ancestors. Um, and, uh, of course, when we think about it, we know that it's true, but we don't often think about it. The idea that um, although we today can read and write effortlessly um, in, in many cases, our ancestors going back even a hundred years or more, um, most of them could not read or write. And if we were, if we go back a thousand years or more, um, hardly anyone could read or write. So there was a completely different way of communicating knowledge, and, a, and that informed or underpinned completely different worldviews. The third thing I want to talk about uh, is something that I've I've been studying quite closely for several decades now, which is ocean surface changes. Why does the surface of the ocean go up and down? Um, and how has that uh, obviously affected the evolution of uh, uh, human society? Uh, and then I want to give you a few examples by by looking back. Um, uh, what, what stories from the past um, do seem to recall um, le legitimate events um, of lands becoming submerged. And the second, uh, sorry, the second, the fifth thing and final thing that I want to talk about is looking ahead. So how can our understandings of the past help us grapple with what increasingly appears to be a rather uncertain future? So uh, setting the scene um, and all the, uh, all the, uh, uh, these photographs are, are from the archeological dig that I directed um, at Borewa in, uh, in Fiji um, for uh, over a period of about seven years, um, about 10 years ago. Uh, and there are wild horses uh, in the area that come out to, to drink from freshwater springs out here in the ocean. Did humans once live under the sea is the first question that I'm going to ask. The second question or second uh, issue I want to tackle is how do we separate fact from imagination? And then I want to talk just very briefly about how I was inspired to write Worlds in Shadow um, and why I think that the issues I write about are particularly important. Did humans once live under the sea? Um, well, of course they didn't, but there is uh, solid evidence that places that our ancestors once inhabited do now in fact lie under the sea, um, all, all over the world, not in the deep ocean, of course. Um, there are no sunken continents in the centers, the deepest parts of the world's oceans. But there are many, many places all around or off the, the present coastline um, that were inhabited by our ancestors. And the traces of that habitation we can sometimes see um, through through diving and the such like. Um, there's a lot of scientific evidence, uh, and I always uh, like to talk about Pavlo Petri, uh, which is in Greece. Um, it's perhaps the world's oldest submerged city. Um, it may have been established, um, it may have been established about 4,000 years ago, um, and it survived certainly for a couple of thousand years. It was a very important trading port, um, but eventually it became overwhelmed uh, by the ocean. And today we can see the traces of Pavlo, Pavlo Petri underneath the sea. Um, here, here is a, a, a shot courtesy of uh, John Henderson um, from the University of Edinburgh who's one of the lead uh, underwater archaeologists uh, working there. So you can see the kinds of buildings that existed. You can see the doorways. Um, Pavlo Petri was famous for having perhaps the first documented upstairs toilet or bathroom in the world. Um, it, it, had a, it had a first floor um, or 
or what you would call a second floor um, bathroom uh, in in one of the houses with with piping leading to the uh, to the sewers outside. So it was quite advanced in terms of uh, technology and habitation. Um, and this is a reconstruction, also from John, um, of the uh, of the known geography of Pavlo Petri. Um, it wasn't a city by today's definition of what a city is, but it was certainly a substantial settlement, and it was organised, as you can see, into streets, um, e each of which had uh, drainage ditches. Um, there were houses arranged along the sides of the street as much as four thousand years ago, um, so it was quite substantial. But now it li lies under um, anything between two and five uh, meters uh, of water, of ocean water, um, in the eastern Mediterranean. It's not just scientific evidence that allows us to identify or recognize submerged places where our ancestors once lived. And this really is the essence of, of my book. We don't have to depend completely on science. There's also evidence from memory, um, which has reached us today through what we call stories and, and myths, sometimes legends. Um, and memory is because people were actually living there at the time, and they encoded their traumatic experience of land loss and ocean level rise in their oral traditions. And some of those oral traditions have managed to survive to come down to us today as, as stories, as myths. And there's a picture there of St. Brandon, who, um, who, who with his fellow monks paddled um, around the North Atlantic, um, perhaps in the fourth century, perhaps much earlier, um, and, uh, uh, and discovered several islands, one of which turned out to be a big fish. Um, the point here is that it sounds like a myth, but in its at its core, its essence, um, there may well be uh, um, a, an empirical truth, um, and and this is something that I will talk about in a minute. How do we separate imagination from fact? Well, I, I think mermaid stories or merfolk stories are a really good way of, of doing this. Um, so Hesiod, uh, as almost 3,000 years ago, was, was writing about underwater uh, kingdoms. Um, you, you can see King Triton there. Um, uh, and uh, almost certainly that story was one that he, as, as a poet, in fact, um, wrote down from oral traditions that were extant at that time. So the point here is that for most of the time these stories have existed, they were communicated orally um, from one generation to the next, uh, like that, going down through time. They weren't written down because people couldn't read, uh, read and write. So to make them more memorable, they were exaggerated. They were wrapped up in layers of mythical embelli embellishment to ensure they, they would be retold. Uh, and that's the way that many of these stories have come down to us today. Um, but today, I think our mistake, I mean, it's not really a mistake, that's a, that's a judgment, but um, what we do is we tend to focus on the outer wrappings rather than um, what, what lies at the core of, of these. So we tend to focus on the fact that, wow, our ancestors believed in mermaids and talking fish and, and things like that um, without asking the question, well, did our ancestors really invent these stories, which is the implicit interpretation, or did they in fact um, uh, did they in fact base them on on memories of times when land and people uh, were submerged? So stories about mermaids, folk, may, may be recollections of times when inhabited lands became submerged. And I would argue the same thing about giants. So stories about giants um, may recall a time when people were able to walk between land masses that later became separated um, by ocean. Um, and this is very important. Um, if, if you have seen the ocean rise and drive, a la uh, drive a, an ocean connection between two land masses that were formerly joined, how do you explain to people um, in an oral tradition that they were once joined and that people could walk between the two? Well, you have to make those people giants in order to make the stories credible. And I think that's where stories about giants uh, came from. But there were some stories that were completely invented. And the, the classic one, um, as every credible geologist will tell you, um, is Plato's story of Atlantis, which was um, you know, written um, well over 2,000 uh, years ago. And without going into great detail, because I suspect many people know about this, but Plato did talk about an 
island continent called Atlantis that um, for a while uh, exhibited the all the qualities of a, of a perfect society, but they were then punished by the gods and, uh, and became submerged. And some people put it in the middle of the Atlantic, some people put it in the Mediterranean, and, and so on and so on. Um, Plato was a great liar. Um, he had this uh, fixed idea in his mind about how societies would work, and he sought vehicles through which to communicate his ideas about the perfect society. Um, and that, I think, is is really where Atlantis came from. He, he lived in Greece. He lived in the eastern Mediterranean where there were earthquakes and volcanoes and tsunami waves and things like that. So he built all this into his narrative around Atlantis to make it appear credible. Um, but it never was credible. And uh, his disciple Aristotle will, uh, you know, wrote on several occasions about um, uh, about it not being credible. But you know, we we want to believe these kinds of things. So many people have have uh, thought that this this was a, a real place, but uh, it wasn't. So very briefly, one slide about my journey to worlds in shadow. Um, in the post Second World War decades, uh, as many of you may know. Um, uncertainty about the future really sparked people's or young people's interest in other worlds and other realities. We wanted to believe that there were better places uh, that existed either in the past or in uh, in other dimensions or, or whatever, really. Um, and then I went to, to university. I, I trained in geology and I learned what was known and what became unknown. And geology is a tremendously exciting subject because we will never have all the answers. You know, it's possible for anyone to train as a geologist and to find something new, something novel that nobody ever knew about before. Um, and then I moved to the Pacific Islands, where I spent 25 years of my life. And most cultures in the Pacific Islands are oral cultures. So people like my old friend, Michele Rassese, now passed on, um, he, he had so much knowledge in his head about the past, about his people's past, about the geography of the areas that he lived in. He couldn't read or write. He couldn't speak English. Um, but he had a huge amount of information, volumes in his head that he was happy to communicate to, to others. Um, and then I was fortunate enough to uh, land up in a full-time uh, research position, which I, I have at the moment, thanks to the University of the Sunshine Coast uh, here in Australia. So how do we understand our ancestors? What, what did our ancestor do? Why, why did they tell stories? And how long could these stories last? And what happened when literacy came along? What happened when people did learn to, uh, to read and, and write? Um, all of these things. So why did our ancestors tell stories? Um, appreciate that up until 100 years or so, most people could not read or write. Um, and if we go back 2,000 years, or nobody could read or write. Um, you know, maybe, uh, maybe an elite, but reading and writing was at that time um, actually used as a weapon of repression. It was actually used to sort of to, to, um, for an elite to survive um, uh, and to maintain, uh, uh, maintain its uh, status uh, relative to, to everyone else. Um, but that didn't mean the fact that people couldn't read or write didn't mean that knowledge was not effectively acquired and stored and communicated. Um, and much information was spoken. But one thing that we've learned, particularly in the last 10 years or so, with the work of Lynn Kelly and other people, is that not only was it spoken, but it was also drawn. It was also recited. It was also performed. It was also sung. Um, all of these things that we today think of as artistic expressions, or all of these things in the past were incredibly pragmatic. They were um, memory aids for particular pieces of information, for particular narratives. Um, so knowledge communication in oral societies was all about survival. Just as knowledge communication in our societies are all of, is all about survival. Okay, We educate our children so that they can cope with their life ahead. Um, and that's exactly the same in oral societies. So what today we label storytelling, um, in the past that was instructive. It wasn't entertainment as it often is today. Because in the past, your descendants' best chance of surviving um, was to know everything that you knew. And so 
children were taught systematically um, all the, uh, about all the things that their forebears and their parents and their grandparents uh, understood. Uh, one of the things that I've uh, learned from studying, um, particularly in Australian cultures, um, is that the survival of stories in oral societies um, depends on the harshness of the country. The more harsh the environment, the more difficult it is to survive, the more important it was to convey all the knowledge in the correct form. Um, and then isolation also helps. And people in have been living in Australia for almost 70,000 years. Uh, and most of that time, they have been isolated from the rest of the world. So there's a much greater continuity of culture here. Let me give you a few examples. So we'll start off in Italy, of course, which I haven't mentioned so far, but um, it's a beautiful picture of a meteorite crater here uh, in, the, uh, in the Apennines, in uh, Serente, uh, in central Italy. And in this area, about, what, 1600 years or so ago, um, the, the area was famed for its paganism and its pagan practices until one evening a meteorite crashed to the earth with a resounding thump. Uh, the people of this area converted to Christianity and have never looked back. And this is a story that was first written down about 140 years ago. The point here is that that story survived uh, generation to generation for 1600 years until it was finally written down. And a place that I've been working with some of my research students over the last uh, uh, few years um, has been Kondavu Island in Fiji, uh, at the western end of which is an enormous volcano called Nambukalevu Volcano. Nambukalevu means the great yam mound. When you plant yams, you make a, uh, make a mound. And that's what, when the cloud is not there, that's what Nambukalevu Volcano looks like. Around 2,500 years ago, this volcano erupted, um, and people on neighboring islands um, witnessed that eruption and can still today tell you stories about what happened. Um, and this is some of the stories that we collected in uh, January 2019 um, from Petro Linadeva um, uh, at uh, Noaisomo village on Ono Island. Um, and the stories that we have collected so far allow us to actually reconstruct the ash cloud that was formed by this volcanic eruption 2,500 years ago um, and how it moved across the islands uh, and had different manifestations in different parts. So, again, this is an example of the power of the depth of oral traditions as well as their longevity. And, and here's a picture that you might be familiar with. This is Crater Lake in Oregon in the western United States. Um, and Crater Lake formed as a result of the terminal, eru terminal eruption of Mount Mazama um, about 7,600 years ago. Here was Mount Mazama. Bang, one day it blew itself up and, and collapsed and formed actually not a crater. It's a caldera. Um, and that's, that's how Mount Mazama looked. Now, the important point here is that when the first literate people reached the area about 200 years ago, um, the Klamath Indian people had stories that recalled this event. Um, so there's really no escaping the implication that they were able to pass down these stories in intelligible form for 7,600 years. And the next example I'll give you comes from Australia, from Mornington Island uh, in the Gulf of Carpentaria, um, part of the Wellesley Island group. Um, here's a map of Mornington Island with the mainland uh, in the southwest uh, there. Um, and there are indigenous Australian stories from the Ladil people that talk about how in the beginning our home islands were not part, not islands at all. They were part of a peninsula um, running out from the mainland. And our people say that these channels were caused by Gangur, a seagull woman who dragged a big raft back and forth across the peninsula to sever its, its neck. So again, a, a very clear story here um, of, uh, of, an oral, of an event that took place probably six or 7,000 years ago. So how long can these stories last? Well, we know that um, stories uh, in Italy last 1,600 years, Fiji 2,500, uh, from Oregon uh, 7,600, and from Australia, we've got several um, of those kinds of oral traditions um, that have lasted uh, for more than 8,000 uh, years. Um, and a lot of these arguments were set out in my 2018 book um, called The Edge of Memory, also uh, published by Bloomsbury. So how did literacy change things? Well, within a few hundred years, um, mass literacy 
or the development of mass literacy led, led to the loss of thousands of years of oral knowledge. Uh, and some remains, of course, but it's commonly misinterpreted. Um, so it's misinterpreted because we think that these are fantastic stories. These are stories that our ancestors invented, uh, and they were so much fun that they were passed down from one generation to another. We, we think of them as products of imagination, uh, as, as entertainment. Um, but, and, and therefore we judge our, our pre-literate ancestors as having survived by luck, um, having little or no ability to combat um, our uncertainty. But that's wrong, because not only have we repurposed storytelling, but also art and poetry and dance, all of which, I suggest, began as pragmatic ways of communicating knowledge in oral societies. And I've called our diminishment of this, I, I've called it the arrogance of literacy. We think that because we are literate, then anything that is not literate is not important um, and cannot contribute anything to our uh, our understanding of ourselves. And I, I would suggest that that's completely wrong. So jumping from, from anthropology, if you like, to uh, climatology, let me briefly talk about ocean surface changes um, and how, uh, since the last ice age, ocean surface changes have led to land loss and the creation of these ancient stories. Okay, I'm not trying to overwhelm you with this slide, um, but basically it shows how the ocean surface has changed over the last 150 years or so, um, from left to right. Left is 150,000 years ago, today is on the right. Um, and it shows the thick blue line changing sea level. Um, it shows where present sea level is today. So you can see that if we look at the average for the last 150,000 years, it's well below, maybe um, 200 feet or so below um, present sea level. 150,000 years ago and today. Um, on the, the left-hand axis is sea level relative to the present, um, uh, and the same in meters on the right-hand axis. And the time that you see there is the last ice age, also known as the last glaciation or the last glacial. Um, the coldest time of the last ice age, when the sea level was lowest, was, between, was around 20,000 years ago. And sea level was low because all the ice that had been created on the land at that time um, was formed from ocean water, was formed from water drawn from the oceans to create that, that ice. And the period that I really am concerned about here is the period of what we call post-glacial sea level rise. And you can see it there on the right of the graph. This very, very rapid rise of sea level associated with the melting of land ice that took place between about 15,000 years ago and about uh, eight, 7,000 years ago. During the period of post-glacial sea level rise, the, the United States, the contaminous United States, lost around 31% of its land area. And if that happened in the future, this is how the map might change. And this is a map from Worlds in Shadow, from my new book. Um, and you can see there's a large chunk of the United States there that's missing. That's the equivalent to what was lost um, in the contaminous United States as a result of sea level rise after the last ice age. Uh, Australia, where I, I, I live at the moment, lost around 23% of its land area. So the, the dark gold is uh, present land area and the lighter shading is what Australia looked like during the last ice age. Um, and we have stories from indigenous Australians of submergence from now about 21 places all the way around the coast of Australia. And you can see them uh, named there. And these are stories that recall a time when the coastline was further out to sea, when what are now islands offshore were contiguous uh, with the mainland, uh, and so on, when the land was actually much bigger than it is today. It's the same thing in Northwest Europe. Um, so Northwest Europe was transformed. What are now England, Wales, and Ireland were connected to uh, what is now mainland uh, Europe. Um, and there are many ancient stories of submergence from this part of the world as well. So looking back, I want to get now into some of the examples. Um, I want to give you samples, uh, samples. I want to give you examples um, from six different places, um, Southeast Asia, Canada, Australia, the Eastern Mediterranean, France, uh, and Scotland. 
and it's one slide each. So uh, I'm going to move through these uh, quite uh, quite quickly. The oldest story uh, of that we know about is from Southeast Asia, and the youngest perhaps from uh, Scotland there. So this is uh, the island of Borneo uh, in Southeast Asia, part of the ancient continent of Sundaland. Um, and you can see on this map um, the present day land areas. You can see also the areas that were submerged as a result of sea level rise uh, in the wake of the last ice age. Uh, and Sundaland was basically the area of the uh, Sunda shelf there. Uh, and we think as the sea level rose, the understanding of rice agriculture was pushed out of this area with migrants uh, into, uh, into Asia. We also know that uh, stories about uh, the fishing up of, of Pacific islands, um, uh, which is often associated in the Pacific with the demigod Maui. Um, this illustration is from the uh, Disney uh, movie Moana. Um, we think that those also originated there and moved out. Um, as a result of the submergence. So submergence drove innovation in other areas. It also drove cultural evolution um, in other areas. Moving to Canada, these are the Haida Gwaii, the Queen Charlotte Islands off the west coast of um, mainland Canada. Um, and uh, one of the last knowledge holders um, in the 1950s was Henry Young, and I talk about him a bit in uh, Worlds in Shadow. And, and he was a great maker of totem poles, but he was also inculcated with uh, many of the stories of his ancestors about times when the ocean surface was lower and rose to submerge the land. Um, and some of those stories um, may go back um, you know, more than 10,000 years. Um, I, I don't have time to go into them in great detail today, but uh, they, they, they do exist in this uh, area. And all the islands, in fact, off that part of um, the Pacific Northwest uh, of the United States and uh, Southwest Canada. Um, going to Australia, this is a backstairs passage in South Australia. You can see it's quite a substantial ocean passage that connects the Australian mainland, um, sorry, that separates the Australian mainland from Kangaroo Island that you can see in the distance. This is a map of the area with Kangaroo Island uh, on the left, uh, that's in the west, and uh, mainland Australia at the Fleurier Peninsula in the, uh, in the east. Um, and there are many uh, indigenous stories from the Geraldi people and others um, about times when it was possible to walk across Backstairs Passage without getting your feet wet. Um, and the depth there today is around 32, 35 meters. So the last time that it was dry and people could have walked across um, was around 10,000 uh, years ago. Uh, now I want to move to Armenia and Mount Ararat, um, possibly where uh, well, there are stories about Noah's Ark being uh, located there. Um, the story of Noah and his Ark um, are more than 2,000 years old, um, and they appear to have um, been from a similar source to the stories of uh, the Epic of Gilgamesh and Utnapishtim, um, which are probably uh, slightly or considerably older, around 4,000 uh, years ago. Um, and you can see where Mount Ararat is there in terms of the geography of the Eastern Mediterranean and uh, the Black Sea. Um, 7,600 years ago in North America, the last part of the great ice sheet on the land slipped into the ocean and it drove water across the Atlantic and through the Straits of Gibraltar and into the Mediterranean. And it inundated all of these coasts, or at least in the Eastern Mediterranean, um, to around depths of about 15 feet. Um, and this was not just flooding. The water didn't recede. The, the water stayed over the land. And I think that it's a pretty good uh, guess to suggest that it was, in fact, these uh, this inundation that sparked the stories of Utnapishtim and Noah uh, and found their way, of course, into the book of Genesis in the Christian Bible, um, found their way into the Quran um, and many other uh, ancient books. And then uh, an area that I've also been working on recently um, is, the, uh, is the area of Brittany in northwest France, um, where there are stories about a submerged city called Is or Kais. Um, and many of those stories place it in one of these uh, two bays um, in 
Western Brittany. Um, and the story of East was that it was once a great city, a walled city, no less, um, which is now out in the ocean. Um, and it was the seat of King Gradlan, um, Gradlon, I'm sorry, uh, who uh, is remembered uh, in local traditions and local sculptures um, uh, extensively. Um, and uh, for one reason uh, or another, depending on which version of the story you look at, um, the uh, floodgates were opened and East became submerged and people had to flee um, and East has, uh, has disappeared. Um, I think this is my last example. This is from the island of St Kilda uh, in Scotland, um, often called the island on the edge of the world because it's so small and so isolated and it no longer has a resident uh, population. But it did once. And the first written account we have of the people of St Kilda was in 1697, when someone called Martin Martin uh, visited the island um, and wrote down some of their traditions. Um, and this particular extract here uh, tells of a warrior famous in their traditions, and they tell you that she was much addicted to hunting, and that in her days all the space between this island and that of Harris Island was one continuous tract of dry land. Um, and this, again, seems to me to be a memory of a time when the ocean surface in this area was lower, and the island of St. Kilda was, in fact, um, continuous with the island of Harris, which is now about 90 kilometers uh, away. Um, so in these kinds of stories that we tend to dismiss as myths and, and legends, there are, I would argue, elements of truth. So the last part of my talk um, this evening is is looking ahead. Um, we live today in a time in a time of changing climate, and often we feel anxious because we sense that this is out, without precedent, and we sense that we have done something to have, to disturb the natural order. Um, and uh, as the study of the past clearly shows, neither of these things are are correct. Um, climate change. Has, is something that has happened many times before. It is something that humans have had to grapple with um, and overcome several times uh, before. There is really no such thing as a, a natural order. The difference today is that unlike the situation in the past, we can see the future with a, a plausible degree of certainty. Uh, and of course, that makes us anxious in ways that our ancestors would not have been. Um, but it also gives us an opportunity to minimize the effects of future climate change on, on the way that we live. So can we learn something um, from our ancestors' experiences of climate change? Well, yes, we, yes, we can. Several things. We can learn that short-term responses to long-term change might be comforting, but they will inevitably waste resources. Um, all, all the climate projections show that we are in for at least a multi-decade period of climate change, um, as our ancestors had to grapple with in the past. So short-term fixes are really not good long-term uh, investments. We can learn from the past that locally developed and driven responses are, are generally superior to, to global ones or, or generic ones. Um, so, so people who sit in New York or in, in Geneva uh, and who develop solutions for places far from uh, th those places, um, those solutions are not always or not usually going to be uh, the ones that are, that, that are best suited to those distant locations. But I think most importantly, we can take hope from the fact of our ancestor survival that, that we too uh, shall endure. And I think that's a really important message. Um, we, we will get past this. Um, there will be inconvenience, but we will get past this. And I just want to give you an example of each of these three lessons, and then I'm done. Um, the first example uh, is, uh, is sea level rise. Um, Coastal flooding in many places is becoming more frequent because the ocean surface is rising. Um, and uh, not, not everywhere, but you know, in 95% of coastal locations. Um, and this is the IPCC report that just came out. Um, I'm a member of the IPCC, although I wasn't involved uh, this time around with this particular chapter. But it does suggest that by the end of this century, sea level is going to be um, close to a meter higher um, than it has been um, 
uh, over the long term. Um, so it's something that is going to see this kind of situation, as we showed in Georgia, um, becoming more frequent. Um, but it's also something that we can we can plan for. Um, sticking with that example, let's look at the past. This is the Nullarbor Plains uh, in Australia. And the people living there uh, in the past, um, when the shoreline was much further out to sea, became very alarmed at the fact that the sea level was rising and the coastline was moving further and further landwards. Um, and there's a story that we have more than 7,000 years old that talks about how sea level rise across uh, the now underwater part of the Nullarbor led the people to pour over the escarpment and begin bundling thousands of spears, that means wooden palisades together, to stop the encroaching water. So this is a memory of a time when people were trying to grapple with the problem of sea level rise, but it happened 7,000 years ago. So what we're seeing today is not without precedent. And then if we jump to Wales, um, and this is an example I talk about quite a bit in Worlds in Shadow, um, the submerged forests off the coasts of Cardigan Bay, um, they are often cited as evidence for the existence of a submerged city, which is deep in Welsh traditions, called Cantra Gwelod, um, which was somewhere out there, which became flooded, um, uh, and, and like many other places uh, in, in this part of the world. And you can see, this is the same map I put up earlier, you can see Cantra Gwelod uh, in Wales, uh, in, in the upper part of this map, uh, and all the French ones uh, and, and others uh, elsewhere. There's Cantra Gwelod. The second example I want to give you, um, again, and this is work that I've been doing with my students uh, in the Pacific Islands recently. Um, this is uh, from Navunievu uh, village on Vanuelevu Island in uh, Fiji. Um, and that's, that's where it is. It's a bit off the beaten track. Um, uh, and in the 1950s, the uh, people of Navunievu were asked to clear their mangroves, which they did. It exposed the coastline to erosion, and they built a seawall in the 70s that's now barely visible. They built another one in the 1990s, and that's falling to pieces. Um, and uh, when I uh, first went there, then the village edge was uh, regularly being inundated. But people are adapting, and they're adapting locally. And one way they're adapting is by slowly moving the village up the slope. So the people of Novodnievo have this very clever idea that whenever a young man from the village gets married and his wife uh, joins him in the village, they are required to build their house higher up the slope. So over the next 30 or 40 years, we will see most of the houses in the village start to move uh, up the slope. Um, and this is a very clever uh, local solution. Um, and then we move to the Netherlands, um, and we look in the past at some of the settlements that were created there, the Terps or the Turpin uh, settlements, which were basically an adaptation of people living in uh, wet, swampy uh, areas, um, and they, they built uh, drainage uh, ditches and, and they, they built hills of soil and, and put their houses uh, on them. And this happened more than 2,500 years ago. Um, and it was really interesting because when the Dutch then uh, colonized the Guianas, uh, you know, about 500 years ago, they found that their indigenous peoples had adapted in similar ways uh, to living along the waterlogged margins of the, of the Guianas. Um, and this is a, a a terp or a mound in Suriname, um, which um, around 650, sorry, AD 650, it was created. And as you can see there, the people would have to have moved the equivalent by hand of 14,000 truckloads of earth to create that mound. So humans are adaptable, um, and they have shown many times in the past that they can adapt. So I just wanted to read this quote quickly from Worlds in Shadow, and, and then I'm practically done. In a world where we are confronted by global change that is as contemptuous of human endeavor and individual aspiration as it is dismissive, dismissive of political borders and agendas, understanding how our ancestors were affected by comparable changes and how they overcame these is at once a lesson in coping as well as a beacon of hope. Uh, and I think that's a very important message that we can take uh, from the past. So we've looked at stories of East and, and lots of the stories of, from Northwest Europe of submerged lands, um, the uh, female warrior from uh, St. Kilda, uh, Utnapishtim, um, and, and Henry Young from 
the Haida Gwaii, uh, and of course Maui from the Pacific. All, all of these represent stories that we have tended to um, pigeonhole as myths and legends, but all of these are stories, I suggest, that actually have some relevance, sorry, some scientific meaning, and also some relevance to uh, the future. And there are many other examples that I haven't had time to talk about this evening. Um, I'm very keen on talking about the, the geology of Yonaguni in Japan and ancient maps of India, um, and even the formation of these giant Pali or landscape scars um, in Hawaii. Um, but for now, uh, my thanks to the Boston Museum of Science and to you um, for uh, for this evening, and especially to the Lowell Institute for funding this event. Um, and I hope that you've enjoyed what I had to say. And now I'm going to pass back to James and stop sharing my screen. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Patrick. Uh, I'm sure you're getting a, a huge round of applause from our virtual audience um, for that fantastic talk. Um, and thank you so much for starting your day with us uh, as we, we wrap ours down. Um, and congrats again on the release of this incredible book earlier this month. Um, how has the release been? What is it like to release a book in the middle of a global pandemic? Well, the book should have come out actually last year. And of course, because of the global pandemic, it was delayed for 12 months. But um, it's it's different, uh, to be honest, James. Um, I, I think we all need some good news. And, 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 and I like to think that I can actually talk to people like you and at events like this without bringing up um, the elephant in the room. You know, there, there is more to life. We will get past the pandemic in the same way as we will get past climate change. We will endure. Um, and there are other things in life that we will um, find joy in, in focusing on. Yeah, I, I love that parallel. It, it came to mind when you sort of spoke on that, that part about the current climate crisis that we're living in and us thinking that it's unprecedented. And there's some questions in here that we'll get to. Um, but before we do, if you have yet to submit a question for Patrick and you have one, you can do so by going to slido.com uh, and enter the code Patrick Nunn, all one word, just as it appears scrolling at the top of your screen. Um, so let's jump in. First one, um, we got a couple of times. People are just curious of how you, what drew you to some merchants as a subject for this book? Like why, why was now the right time to write this book? I'm, I'm a geologist and a climate scientist, and one of the areas that I specialize in is the reconstruction of past ocean level changes or past sea level changes. Um, and, and this is something that I think people tend to underestimate in terms of human history. Um, you know, for most of the time that humans have been on the earth, the sea level has been rising or falling. There's never been um, any kind of a real sort of multi-generational stability of sea level. Um, so it's it's a really important topic that I think is uh, under-discussed. Um, one of the things that I'm working on at the moment is um, with some psychologists actually looking at the trauma that humanity um, must have fed, uh, must have felt, and must must be sort of stored up, um, uh, you know, somewhere in, in, in our minds, um, that results from all the land loss associated with sea level rise in the aftermath of the, the last ice age, um, which doesn't really ask your question, answer your question. Um, I just think it's an absolutely fascinating topic, you know. Um, it, it's one that people become very passionate about when it's something that affects them, and it's something I think that we need to learn more about. Agreed. And um, a specific question about... Um, how do you think that the internet and other current technologies might impact how we pass down ancestral knowledge of the natural world in the future? Well, my next book is going to be called Nearing the End of the Book, which is really a, a play on words because I think we are nearing the end of the time where we privilege um, books um, above, above all else. Um, and I don't think it's something that we, we should applaud or it's something that we should regret. It's just something that happened, rather like the transition from orality to literacy. But I think we can learn from the lessons or the mistakes, if you like, of that transition, is that when people became literate, they immediately 
dismissed or, or demeaned um, orality as, as a way of um, storing and encoding and explaining the natural world. And I think that was a mistake. So uh, I think you know, if, we, if we ponder the future, we realize that, that people will become more, um, get, get more of their knowledge from the internet, more of their knowledge from um, their iPhones and things like that. It's, it's going to happen, no, no question about it. Um, but we should think about ways of, of balancing the different sources of knowledge that, that we have. And I love that we got that that plug for the next book. So we definitely know that we'll have a follow-up <laughs> event. Um, I haven't started writing it, James. <laughs> oh, well, well it's, it's, uh, we'll plan very far, far ahead. Far ahead. <laughs> um, so this question came in a couple of times, but is there a place in particular that you're fascinated by or that really drew your interest during the research of this book? Well, yeah, yes. Um, you know, you know, if you can indulge me, I, I, I really sort of cut my teeth on this in the Pacific Islands, where I spent such a long period of my life. And, you know, I've ended up in a situation now where I speak fluent Fijian, um, and I can go to rural communities, at least in Fiji, and I can get their, their, their stories first hands, and I can ask questions about them. And that, that really has opened, that really opened my mind, I think, to the power of oral traditions and the power of oral knowledges compared to literate knowledges. And then when I moved to Australia in 2010, um, I found myself in a place where um, possibly the world's oldest continuous culture, it's, it's been around for 70,000 years or more, and there are, it, it created perfect conditions for the preservation of ancient knowledge. So we have uh, stories of land submergence in Australia that go back at least 10,000 uh, years. And we can demonstrate that because they're recalling coastlines um, that were submerged 10,000 years ago. We've got stories of volcanic eruptions um, that go back seven or 8,000 uh, years ago. Um, uh, and, and one of my colleagues uh, is arguing that there are stories of a volcanic eruption in southern Australia that goes back almost 37,000 years uh, ago, but it's not, it's not really well constrained. Um, so in terms of favorite places, um, I, I love working in Australia, but I suppose um, moving, or not moving, um, working in Brittany uh, in northwest France is really the, the, the place that I would like to spend more time. Um, not just because of the French food and the and the baguettes and, and and things like that, but but also because the landscape there is so fascinating and it's a it's a corner of Europe where um, oral traditions uh, and cultural identity are still very very strong compared to most other parts of Europe. So um, ideally, in a post pandemic world, I'd like to you know have a year's sabbatical in uh, in Nantes or somewhere like that. Great and. There's a couple of questions about looking to the future, um, as I had noted before. Um, so someone's asking, while climate change has occurred in the past, is there not reason to believe that due to the impact of humans that was not present in previous instances, that the current climate, climate change is not exactly the same and may not pass harmlessly? Well, yes, of course. Um, I, I suppose I'm talking in a very general way um, that climate change per se, is not novel, uh, and that climate change that affects human societies for hundreds, even thousands of years, is not unprecedented. And humans, our ancestors, had to grapple with these kinds of things. Um, you, you know, that said, as a climate scientist, of course, um, humans have unequivocally accelerated the pace of recent and contemporary and, and future climate change. Um, and we will have novel challenges um, resulting from this. And the fact that there's more of us and the fact that we've built huge coastal cities, um, of course. Um, but I don't see that um, by itself as a cause for undue pessimism. Um, we really are the smartest species on this planet. Um, if we can't come up with a solution to this, then, you know, clearly, um, we're letting ourselves down. And on that note, sort of a, a, a secondary follow-up to that, it's interesting to hear you say we are living today thinking our current climate crisis is unprecedented when it isn't. Why isn't this more widely understood? And do you think that media and technological advances play any role in this? Um, 
I, I think it's not widely understood because people think we can't possibly have been here before because there's so many of us and because you know these things are happening so quickly um both of which are correct um but in terms of for example the rise of sea level causing land loss um in the future this has happened in the past and it's happened quite profoundly in the past you know 30 25% of land mass is being lost as a result of post-glacial sea level rise. Um, so we can look to the past and we can learn something about the past. Um, but I agree that the, the general perception is, in many cases, is that we have not been there before, but we have. Great. And besides this incredible book, which you can uh, pick up uh, if you go to the virtual program, um, and you can enter the discount code that's on there as well. Um, are there any other sources or readings that you would suggest around um, this topic and the science of submergence that people can, can check out? <clears throat> well, I mean, there, there are other books, of course. Um, I think one of the most innovative books written in the last 10 years is the um, book called The Memory Code, by uh, Dr. Lynn Kelly. And uh, in that, she talks about how ancient societies memorized knowledge and passed it on from one generation to the next um, and why, including stories of, of submergence. But specifically for lands under the sea, um, there's, there's not a lot out there that actually treats those kinds of stories as anything other than a good story. Uh, and, and I think that's really the point of my book, um, is that um, we've been doing this now for so long. We've been celebrating the existence of myth and legend in our societies and saying, this is what identifies us and this is what makes this place special, without realizing that these stories are in fact not invented but are in fact based on actual memories of things that actually happened, um, and I think that's that's the difference there. And I don't want to say that you know I'm the I'm the greatest writer or this is the greatest book ever written on the subject, but it is, I think, the first time that any scientist has ever sat down and said there is value in submergence myths and legends that has gone unrecognized. Wonderful, and. Um what advice do you have for students or young people who might want to follow in your footsteps and, and study the science of submergence? Well, go for it. I, <laughs> I mean, really. Um, <laughs> you know, in the United States, uh, you know, the pathway is really through a geology degree um, or, or uh, maybe a degree in, in, uh, in, in climate change. Um, I, I think... I think there's a lot of nonsense written about this subject, and I think people have to um, learn to separate, you know, the nonsense. I mean, if you pick up any of Graham Hancock's books, you know, they're they're vastly entertaining, but you know, they're almost um, entirely um, wrong. Um, you know, and I, I don't mean to disparage him or pick him out. Uh, you know, there's there's lots like that. I mean, I, I grew up with the stories of Charles Berlitz and and the Bermuda Triangle and things like that, and I was enthralled by these things. But they're all uh, they're all nonsense. Um, you know, so I, I think people have to learn to develop a critical sense about what's credible and what's not credible, because there's plenty of people out there who who write books that that try to sort of take you off um, the, the path of credibility. Um, so look, look, my my advice would would be um, follow the the geology route. Um, I think also have an open mind about ancient stories. They are all over the world, and and I think anyone can really um, investigate these for themselves uh, and and analyze them for themselves. Wonderful. Well, I think that's a great uh, way to end this incredible evening. Uh, we want to be respectful of your time. You still have a full day ahead of you. Um, Patrick, we can't thank you enough for joining us all the way 
uh, from Australia, and we're so thrilled that we could be a part of the release of this book. Um, everyone out there, make sure you pick up your own copy of Worlds in Shadow. It is on sale now. Um, you can check out the virtual program um, for an easy way to pick up your own copy. Patrick, we, we hope that we can continue to stay in touch and be a part of your research and hopefully bring you all the way over uh, to the States, to Boston in the future for the next book. I, I would love that, James. And look, thank you all very much for, uh, for coming this evening. And it's been a great honor for me to talk to the uh, Boston Museum of Science. Thank you. Wonderful. And uh, just a huge thank you again to the Lowell Institute for making tonight possible. And thank you to all yep. of you for spending your Tuesday night with us. We hope you will continue to do so all fall. Check out that full lineup uh, at mos.org slash adults. But until we see you next time, stay safe, stay well, and have a wonderful evening. Good night.